Good morning. Got a long one this morning. I'm going to read from Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. If you'll bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we do thank you for this beautiful weather, Lord. We thank you for the sunshine, the rain, all the blessings upon blessings that you give us, the beauty of creation that we take for granted so often. Lord, help us to praise you in the midst of the beauty of the world in the, and in the midst of the valleys when we get into the lows, Lord, in our life. Help us to know that, that we can do all things through Christ that gives us strength, Lord. Help us to know that you are in complete and sovereign control. Help us to love you and love others with all that we have, Lord, so that we can not only be a message as far as our voice to the world, but to be an example by the way we live, to bring glory and honor to you. Lord, that this has been your plan from the, from the beginning of time as we know it, Lord, and we know that you will finish out this good work that you've done, this salvation through Jesus Christ. So, Lord, fill our hearts with the love of Jesus that we cannot help but con uh, to let it uh, speak through us, Lord, in everything that we do. Open our, our eyes and ears to hear the Spirit, Lord, and be obedient, Lord, as we walk like Jesus in this world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Mark said the reading was a little long, but if you don't know, that is one sentence, one thought structure in the Bible. It is the longest sentence in the Bible, but if you don't, didn't read it or you haven't thought about it that much, read that over and over and over again because it tells all about this marvelous plan that God has, which includes you and I. So this week you should have read Ezekiel chapter 45 to 48, Song of Solomon chapters 1 to 8, 1 Samuel chapter 1 to 6, John 19 20, verse 23 to chapter 21, and Ephesians 1 to 4. Whew! It's a lot of reading. But it's about the same amount, if you didn't realize it, we're just all over the place. So I like to wrap up Ezekiel first, and oh, I entitled this called A Love Story. Did you look at Ezekiel that way? Did you get a love story out of it? Because most of the time people look at Ezekiel and look at it as future prophecy, and it's hard to figure out, and all this, and it just goes on and on. It seems Ezekiel's one of those major prophets, meaning he wrote a lot, wrote in the time frame of Jeremiah and Daniel, who were major prophets, a lot of writing and a lot of uh, prophecies about the future. But if you look at all of those writings, there's a lot about the love of God for people that are um, unlovable. <laughs> Can I say that? Because we're so unfaithful in everything. But God is faithful. God is loving and kind and merciful. So it is a love story. 
After we left the Valley of Dry Bones, we read about the restoration of the temple, the priests, the God's glory coming back into, uh, from Babylon back into the temple where His children would dwell, dwell, not just the temple. And you saw a picture of Eden being restored, if you didn't catch that. Is this the Messianic 1,000-year reign that you've been taught about? I don't know how you've been taught. You might have been taught that. You might not have been taught that. I don't know if it is or isn't. And that's not the point of Ezekiel's writing again. The point of Ezekiel's writing is that God loves His people and that His glory, and Ezekiel got a glimpse of that, if you remember back in his first vision, and that set up Ezekiel's whole life where he gave up his life for God. Aren't we supposed to give up our life for Jesus, the one that died for us? And Ezekiel, if anybody got a bad end of the deal, if you want to call it that, but it's still a good end of the deal, Ezekiel was one who really got a bad rap, if that's how you want to look at it. I mean, he did one thing after another to try to proclaim the message so that the people in Judah would turn from their wicked ways and turn back to God so that they would love God with all of their heart, all of their mind, all of their soul, all of their strength. But the people didn't listen. No matter what he did, he did some crazy things. And then God said, I'm going to take your wife and you can't even mourn her. You know, I got thinking about that and said, you know, I wonder how his wife reacted. Did he, his wife react like Job's wife and say, curse God and die? Or was his wife with him the whole time and his helpmate that he needed and was there for guidance and when she passed, he, she wasn't there anymore? Or was she, like I said, back with Job's wife and saying, when are you going to curse God? Have you not had enough of all of this? But see, Ezekiel saw the glory of God. He saw a vision and it changed everything. Have you ever looked at a picture of the cross? A picture of your Savior on the cross? And the pictures that we have don't do justice because Isaiah says that he was beyond human recognition. He was so badly beat up and torn up. And he did all of that because of his love for us. And besides the physical, he sweated blood drops out of his, out of his sweat because he was so emotionally distraught for what he would have to go through that he was going to have to take all of mankind's sins, one who had never known sin, and be separated from God that God's wrath would be taken out on him, that he would be crushed for your sins so that you could be redeemed. Knowing God's plan, that you would also be adopted. You ever thought about that? Adopted. Nothing that you could have done on your own, but because of the integrity, the love of the person who decided to adopt you, because they were merciful and kind, and they wanted you to be a part of their family. Ezekiel went through all the things that he went just because he saw a vision of God's glory and then a hope of restoration through Jesus Christ. And if you look at the end of Ezekiel, you'll notice that there's a, wa a trickle of water coming out. And as he goes further and further, he measures it deeper and deeper and deeper. Doesn't that remind you of the living water that Jesus talked about in John? That springs of living water would flow out of you the more that we live for Christ, the more that that water is going to dwell up till it reaches a point of a river and brings in so many people. There is life that that river brings. So maybe, just maybe, what Ezekiel's talking about is not a thousand-year physical reign somewhere in the future, but maybe he's talking about the kingdom of God that is here and now through Jesus' church that He will build and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Because aren't we supposed to be that living water that brings life? Aren't we supposed to be light to this world? Aren't we supposed to hear the shepherd's voice and follow only him? And I don't know if you noticed how the book of Ezekiel ended, but it said, In the name of the city, from that time on will be the Lord is there. The temple veil was torn and you have access to the Father. You are a, a group of holy priests, a family, Jesus' brothers, children of God the Most High, children of light. All of these things, isn't the Lord here? So are we living as though the Lord dwells inside of us? Jesus said He wouldn't forsake us, that He would send the promised, ask the Father to send the promised Holy Spirit. The same resurrecting power that brought Jesus back from the dead. <laughs> the Lord definitely is here, but is He living through you? 
So maybe if you look back, maybe you'll see the love story that I'm talking about more. And if you notice when you read that, that, especially if you read the NIV, which a lot of us do, 400 times it said the sovereign Lord, the sovereign God, that He reigns from on high. In the middle of all this chaos in Ezekiel's life and the things going on in Israel and Judea and Babylon and everywhere else in the world, God reigns. He is not the author of sin by any means, but He can use even sin to bring about His good will. Satan thought that he was going to defeat Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ by taking Him to the cross. Instead, it was His own defeat. And Jesus said that the, the prince of darkness at this time, His power had been taken away so that you could have the power to live, to live free. And if you read that about the sovereign God, the sovereign Lord who reigns, you will also notice that it was so that the children of Israel, the children of Judah, the ch every child in this world would know that He is the Lord. The one worthy of praise and honor, the one in control of all things, the one that deserves your allegiance, respect, love. Who loves rebellious children, who even loves the world. Who will bring about His wrath, but there is a hope. Oh, that the children of God in this new thing that we're seeing, this new family orientation that we see, will be children of light and will bring living water to the world as they live like Christ in the world. There is true hope. Not some kind of hope like we hope it doesn't rain today, but hope grounded period in everything that we read in the Bible that Jesus Christ died for our sins and that He will recome re again and restore this world and we will reign with Him. In fact, we're already seated in the heavenly realms with Him. This is not our home. That's why we have to be like aliens and foreigners and sojourners in the world. Is that how you read the book of Ezekiel? But why would God allow His children to be captured? And how or why would God's glory leave the temple and allow it to be destroyed? Did you catch all those things? Wouldn't you allow your child to get hurt and take a fall so that they didn't later run out in front of a car and die if you knew all of those things? A temple, a man-made temple is not where God dwells. He dwells with His children and now dwells inside of you. You are God's temple. Didn't we sin and rebel against God? Didn't we deserve more, much more than captivity? Don't we deserve His eternal punishment for our sins? But because of the grace of God and what Jesus Christ did, that He humbled Himself, not only to go to the cross, but humbled Himself and became flesh and blood and lived among us, and the world rejected Him. But to all those who did believe, He gave the right to be called children of God. Have you listened to the truth? Or are you continu continuing to live in this world in an adulterous affair with the things of this world? The love affairs, the things that you put your faith in rather than in, in Jesus Christ. Our sins, our sins separated us from God, but Jesus Christ brought us back. He paid the price. And now God dwells inside of us and He will be with us forever. God's glory did return to the temple, to a new line of priests, a new hope. Looks a lot like the church again to me. We are His children, the ones that have been given a new heart and a new spirit so that we can be obedient, so that we can be guided by the Spirit of truth that will lead and guide us into all truth, that will produce fruit in our lives as long as we stay in the vine, which is Jesus Christ. Under a new leadership, a new king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So are you living like that or are you waiting for this thousand year millennial reign to see it happen? Because I think, I know, that God wants to see His glory shine through His people now. Why would He come and dwell with us unless He wanted to live like, like Jesus in this world? Why would Jesus tell us these things? Why would He give us these commands and the examples to love others even as He loved us and gave Himself for us? Jesus' children offering living water, offering life, 
to a world who tries to find life somewhere else and desperately seeks and knows that the things that they put their trust and hope in only lead to death. Will you trust in King Jesus? Here's some scriptures to think about. John chapter 2, verse 18, The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple. What was he talking about? And I will raise it again in three days. They were thinking physical again, but Jesus was talking about spiritual. He was talking about his body, but he was talking about a temple in a different way. They replied, It has taken us 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? Verse 21, But the temple he had spoke about was his body. Do you think about that when you look at all these verses that say that you are God's temple, your body is? It's your, his dwelling place, meant to stay holy, set apart for this world, for his glory, for his honor. Think back of all the laws in Leviticus and everything and, and the, the severity if you didn't follow those. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Are you doing that each and every day in every way that you can? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possessions, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you then as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that He visits us. Did you read through Ezekiel and just think these rules that were set up for the priesthood and everything were for this millennial age or did they apply to you again? In John chapter 7, Jesus yelled out in verse 37, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. This is in the middle of the ceremonies and all the religious hierarchy, whatever words you want to say that they did, the traditions and everything. And he yelled out, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. And we are to follow in his footsteps, being his disciples, following after the master. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from them. By this he meant his spirit. So how did Ezekiel live as a result? He was supposed to be a priest, and on his 30th birthday, God changed it to him a prophet. Uh, but yet, we're supposed to be priests, and we are supposed to prophesy. That means the truth, whether we have knowledge of future events or not, or just, oh, we do have knowledge of future events, don't we? <laughs> we do, because those mysteries have been explained to us. We know that there will be a time when Jesus restores all things. We know this same vision that Ezekiel talked about, about this new Eden. So are we living like we do realize that? Are we being priests and are we prophesying? Or do we worry about ourselves and the things that we need to do? Are we living for Jesus or still living for the flesh? Did it cost Ezekiel? Oh boy, yeah. I mean, the only example you might find maybe a little bit more is Job. I mean, I was thinking about this when I think Barry said it, yeah, Barry said, pray for patience for Rose. I was thinking, Job and Rose. <laughs> That's my two examples of patience. Get it? <laughs> but Ezekiel, like I said, he went through terrible thing after terrible thing for God's good. Can I say it that way? Because he caught a glimpse of God's glory and a hope of restoration through Jesus Christ. Would you do that? I would be very hesitant, to be honest. He only saw God's glory, and I have seen the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. That's a sobering thought. So I ask myself again, would I live like Ezekiel lived in this world? <coughs> giving up everything, even the loss of my wife and not mourning her for the call of God in my life. Gospel of John chapter 19. That's where we picked up in John. Jesus is on the cross. 
facing God's wrath. And He does it willingly. He does it out of, love, out of love for us and obedience to God. He lays down His life as a sin offering, totally acceptable to God. An offering that is burnt up, used up completely so that we could be rams ransomed back to God. And as I said before, not just brought back into a relationship with God, because this new Eden that, that, that Ezekiel gets an example of is so much greater. I mean, we look at the difference in just the, the, the fruit trees. There's, there's a, a, a fruit bearing, two trees bearing a fruit, different fruit each type of the month compared to the first one. Exponentially, that's so much greater. But what about our relationship with God? Before we walked with God, now we walk as His children. Something the children of Israel never would even fathom to have a relationship as a personal child with God. Adopted into His family, being His heir, all because of how much God loves us. Even through centuries and centuries of disobedience and stiff-necked rebellion. Joseph and Nicodemus come out of the darkness into the light, don't they? Oh, wow. They feared all the things that men might do to them. They stuck on their prestige, their power, their religious authority, whatever the things were, and they asked to take this man's body down off the cross, this one that Pilate has labeled King of the Jews in every known language at the time. Mary is distraught and weeping in John chapter 20 because she goes and encounters angels and an empty tomb. When she realizes Jesus is not there, when she realizes that Jesus does show up there behind her, she tries to embrace him. And Jesus says to her in John 20, verse 17, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Wow, this verse. Don't just pass by it. Do not hold on to me. Don't cling to me. Because you have a job. I have not ascended to the Father yet. Go back and read John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. All of this teaching to the inner group there that He was going to the Father and He was sending the Holy Spirit so they could live like Him in this world and finish the works that He started. So he said, don't hold on to me, don't cling to me, because I haven't gone to the Father yet. Go instead to my brothers. Here's your first example of going and telling. And tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father. By the Spirit, we can cry, Abba, Father, which is the Aramaic form for Daddy. To my God and your God. A God that dwells with His people, that now dwells inside of His people. And the Holy Spirit still hasn't come at Pentecost yet here. Don't hold on to Jesus. Embrace the Holy Spirit and live for Jesus and for God's glory. Then Jesus goes on to say in verse 19, or we go on to read in verse 19, On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, What did He say? First thing He said to the group, Peace be with you. After, that, after He said this, He showed them His hands and His side, these proving facts. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said what? Peace be with you. Takes me back to John chapter 14 to do not let your hearts be troubled. Why? Because I'm going away, but I'm preparing a place for you. The song that you picked out talked about that when you said read the words. Focusing our eyes on Jesus. Living for that home that we're going to. Not living for this home, but planning that trip. Who would go on vacation again and take their children? Because we're going to take our children too, right? On vacation. Who would not prepare for that trip? Make the plans do whatever we needed to do, pack the clothes, tell your children where we're going. Talk about the Lord when we get up, when we go out, when we, go, when we eat, when we sit down, when we go to bed. And teaching them to obey everything. Peace be with you as the Father has sent me. Oh, why did he say that right after he said peace be with you a second time? Because as the Father sent me to do his work, I am sending you. Oh, that only applies to the twelve, right? 
or the 11 at this time? No. It applies to everyone who wants to be a disciple of Jesus. And if you want to be a disciple of Jesus, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after me. And anyone who wants to be a disciple of Jesus, who willingly looks back, longingly looks back at, this, at the world, longing for it, is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. Let's go back to the ch children of that generation of Israel that did not enter the promised land because they longed for the things back in Egypt, the, thing of the things of the world, the things they knew that held them in captivity and saw the mighty powers of God that delivered them but still longed to go back. Verse 22, And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Well, we know from continuing to read the Bible that the Holy Spirit came in power on Pentecost. So what was this here? Was it just symbolic? What was it? Well, I don't, I'm not going to get into exactly what you think it is. You can think whatever. But again, just reading the text simply, Peace be with you. Peace be with you. I'm going away and I'm sending you. Just as I came from heaven and was sent, I'm sending you. Receive the Holy Spirit. Just like the power that created the breath of God that gave life to all of creation, including you, you and I, to be made in the likeness of image of God, to choose right from wrong, now by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can not only choose right from wrong, but you have the power to live it. Something that Scripture points all the way to, something that Ezekiel talked about that we could not do before, but you and I under the power of the Holy Spirit can live different than before. So as Hebrews says, only through us and the Old Testament prophets and saints can we be this family of God that He's always intended us to be. But maybe we should wait to the thousand-year millennial reign instead and, rather than living it today. I don't think so. I think we should live each and every day by the breath of God, the power of God living through us to be huh, like Ezekiel and even Job in this world, if that's what it's calling for you. But for most of us, that's not the case. So what's your excuse for not living to God's potential now? Proclaiming His message, loving God with all your heart and loving others as Christ loved and gave Himself for the church. Then Thomas believes because he physically touches and sees Jesus. They declare Him Lord. He hears the words of peace and he hears His call reaffirmed. And he knows that that's through the power of the Holy Spirit. Then Jesus tells him in verse 29, Because you have seen me, you have believed, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. There's all of us. If you don't think we're in that calling, right there it is. Those who truly follow after the Master, those who understand all the I am's that Jesus talked about. John 21, chapter 21, repurposing and commission of a falling fisherman that denied Jesus three times and said he never would do that and felt like probably he was unworthy of anything. Now God restores him to be a, not a fisher man, but a fisher of men. Jesus asked Peter three times if he loves him. And then we have his responses. And then we have commands. Did you catch that? I'm going to just briefly do this because this is a complete sermon, if not more than one sermon. Jesus' first question was, do you agape me? more than these. Do you love me with the love of God more than you love these fellow human beings, the things of this world? Peter's response was, Yes, Lord, I know that you, uh, you know that I phileo you. I have brotherly love for you. Okay? Jesus' resulting command, Bosco, which means feed, my arneon, my little lambs, feed my little lambs. We go back to Jesus talking about his sheep and how he would shepherd them and how we would go in and out and find pasture. Pasture is a form of feeding. Okay? Jesus' second question, do you agape me again? Do you love me with the love of God? Peter's second response, yes, Lord, you know I phileo you again. I have brotherly love for you. Is that how you see Jesus? He's just your friend? Or is He your Lord as well as your Savior? Because I say it all the time and I'll continue to say it. He's probably not your Savior if He's not your Lord. You profess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. You follow after Him. You take up His mantle. You give up your life because it was purchased from hell. 
Jesus' resulting command, Pomanio, I don't know if I said it even close, <laughs> tend, which does mean to pasture, but it also means not just to pasture, but find nourishment for them, to take care of them. My probaton, my sheep, or plural, sheep. I put sheep so you understand it's plural, even though that's not a word. To take care of, tend my sheep. Don't just feed them, but take care of their needs so that they'll become healthy and strong. I'm going to say that he meant more of a singular here, but I'll tell you why in a minute, but not necessarily. So Jesus asked him one more time, do you phileo me? He changed it. Now you and I wouldn't catch that just in our normal uh, transcripts there because we don't know Greek as much. Walt does. <laughs> but he went to his level and said, do you brotherly love me? Well, I guess that struck him in his heart. If Christ asks you if you only brotherly love him or if you love him as King of kings and Lord of lords, there's a huge difference. Peter's final response is, you know all things. You know that I phileo love you. I'm, I'm just a man. I denied you. I don't, I don't have this power on my own to love you with all of my heart, all of my soul, and all of my strength. But I will when the Holy Spirit comes. You've taught me that already. And we see the mighty power that Peter preached and lived by once the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. Jesus' final result in command was Bosco, feed my probaton, my sheep, and I'm going to say it's plural here. That's why I said I took the word as singular and now it's plural. That's not necessarily the right meaning, but the word can be used either way. So I think he went from singular to you realize this that you have in front of you, this mission that you have, to be a part of building upon the chief cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ, building this family of people that I call the church. The gates of hell won't prevail against it. Will you build upon it? And Paul tells us about how we build upon that. And it doesn't matter who's building upon it. And it doesn't matter if one part seems more significant than the other. You have a job to build upon that. Do you love him? Do you love Jesus with all your heart? Are you reluctant because of your failures or because of whatever in your life to feed God's sheep? To tend them, to take care of them because that's your job following after the shepherd, being light and life, eating the food that gives eternal life and drinking the living water so that you can give it to others. Verse 18 of John chapter 21, Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted to go. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands in submission and someone else will dress you and lead you where you don't want to go. I guarantee you Ezekiel thought that many, many, many times. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said, where we started eventually, with, or in the beginning with Peter's calling, follow me. Forsake everything else in this world and follow after me as your Lord and Master. So you think God was unfair to Ezekiel? Humanly, you've got to say yes. Because <laughs> you've got to think, God created us, and you can take Scripture and, and prove this fact, at least in your own mind, that we were created to enjoy everything in this world. And you are, but the call of God comes first, whatever it is. And if he calls you to give up everything and not even mourn because your helpmate was there right beside you the whole time, giving you the strength to go on, the only person that you had that you put your strength in humanly was gone and taken from you, you still trust in God. You don't know all the answers. You don't know anything else because you've seen a glimpse of his glory, let alone his love for you through the cross. You follow him, period, on the mountaintops and the valley lows. Ezekiel was obedient to God and he was a messenger to the people even though it felt like no one listened to him. Didn't God create everything with his breath? Didn't he create them for his glory? But he gave us a choice and we chose to rebel. 
and that could be the end of the story, but because of God's great and amazing love, oh, you talked about it, you read about it in Ephesians, in that long sentence that explained all that, that we don't even know about this has been going on from the beginning of time as we know it. This was God's plan that included you because of Christ Jesus. Doesn't he have the right to ask you whatever you, he asks you? Especially since he purchased you back. Especially since he didn't just purchase you back, but he made you his only, or made you his child. So I'll read that again. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself. And you went where you wanted. But when you're older and more mature, when you understand more, you'll stretch out your hands in humble submission and someone else will dress you and lead you where you don't want to go. Follow me. If you remember back from John chapter 14, Jesus said, All these things I've spoken to you while I was still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Oh, that's kind of like we just read about, isn't it? This peace that we have. Because without this peace, even if we think we have trust, we're still going to have issues. Because we're going to say, oh, there's cancer and I trust you, Lord, that you'll take it away. But are you at peace, whatever God calls? Are you at peace if He calls you to lose your spouse and follow after Him and not mourn or lay on your side for <laughs> over a year or whatever it might be? I do not give it as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled and don't be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so when it does, you will believe. You will put your faith and your trust in me regardless of circumstances. John chapter 16 started out this way. All, I have told, all this I have told you so that you won't fall away. So that when these testing and trials come, you won't turn your back on God. And how many people have you seen do that? They trust the Lord, period, till this calamity comes in their life. And then they won't trust God anymore. Did they ever trust Him to begin with? They will, they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they're offering a service to God. They do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their, their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you in the flesh. But now I am going to him who sent me. Oh, and Jesus said, I am sending you. <clears throat> but none of you ask, where are you going? We're back to the song that we sang again. Do you know where you're going? It makes all the difference in this life. That can alone, if you fix your eyes on Jesus and where you're going, can help you put some trust and faith in these things and not worry about it. That's why Jesus said this. <clears throat> Rather you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly I tell you, it is good for you that I am going away because unless I go away, the advocate... Your friend, those, that person that stands beside of you, that comforts you, who gives to the Father and says that you're, you're His because He seals you. He will not come to you, but if I go, I will send Him to you. When He comes, He will prove the world to be wrong in sin, righteousness, and judgment. About sin because people don't believe in me. About righteousness because I'm going to the Father. And I know I said this before, but I want you to think about it again because I want to point this out. About righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. Then it goes to judgment. You can see me no longer, but you live by the power of Spirit like me. And I, that proves that you're in a right standing. Because by faith, Noah built an ark. By faith, Abraham did this. By faith, Isaac did this. They lived differently than the world around them. So that will prove righteousness. Because sin has been proven because people don't really believe. So they continue in the darkness rather than the light. But not you if you believe because you come out into the light so it can be known that you're a child of light. And about judgment because of the prince of this world now stands condemned because Jesus Christ has paid the price in full. No other doctrine. We don't need the works. We don't need anything else. Jesus Christ has paid it all. Do you believe? 
And will you follow after him and live by the power of the Spirit that he promised to send to you that you, you received on the day that you believed? I have much more to say, than you, more than you can bear now, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. And then verse 33, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. Do you realize your mission? Do you have the hope that Jesus professes? Have you been sealed and filled by the Holy Spirit to be like Christ in this world? To let Jesus turn you into a fisher of men? Song of Solomon. Did you understand it at all? It's a love story. It's love poetry. It is kind of weird. If you, if you take it Literally, again, you're going to get some strange images. <laughs> but it's about courtship. About marriage. The way marriage should be. And then not only about the marriage day or early in the marriage, but as the marriage goes on and on and on and how that love grows stronger and stronger and stronger. Does that make you think at all about this love story? that God loves the world so much that He gave His one and only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him will never, ever perish, but instead have eternal life. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6 says, Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death, its jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters can't quench love, rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were to give all the wealth of one's house for love, it would be utterly scorned. Alan, do you love me? Alan, do you love me? Alan, do you love me? Then am I feeding God's sheep? It's not just for me as a shepherd here, but for each and every one of us who hears the call of Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1, that longest sentence in the Bible, did you notice it was a poem too? <laughs> a song to be celebrated? Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms, not just here on earth, but in the heavenly realms, with every spiritual blessing in Christ, everything we need. For He chose us before the creation of the world. He chose us to be holy and blameless in His sight, which I can't do except by the power of the Spirit, which we'll get to that in a little bit. In love, He predestined us for the adoption to sonship through Christ Jesus, to be His very own child, nothing that we've done to be a child of God our Father in heaven, to be part of His inheritance. In accordance with His pleasure and will, it's something He desired, to the praise of His glorious grace. Because I said before, the one who adopts, it's about Him who adopts, not about the one who was adopted. The one adopted was rescued, which He has freely given us in the one He loves. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Christ. That right there ought to get you just eating and devouring the Word and praying to the Spirit to reveal the love of God to you. Oh, we're going to get to that in Ephesians, aren't we, in a minute? to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In Him we were also chosen, having been, been predestined, according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity with His purpose and will, in order that we, who are the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of His glory. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, just like Jesus said, Blessed are those who hear who have not seen and touched. The gospel of your salvation, when you, were, when you believed you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Wow. If that's not a love story, then you don't understand love. 
whatsoever. Love that keeps no records of wrongs. Love that doesn't think about itself, thinks about others. Love that is patient, and kind, and long-suffering. The Holy Spirit, verse 14, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. When? Until the redemption of those who are God's possession. To the praise of His glory. Now that's a love story that has to be told. So what is Paul's response to this love story? Verse 15. For this reason, this is what inspires him to live, but yet the flesh is weak. So he has to live by the power of the Spirit. Ever since I heard about your faith, the time that you believe and put your trust in the Lord Jesus, and your love for all of God's people, love the Lord your God and love others, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that God, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know Him better. So as we read about Jesus and God's love, we see that God was made flesh in Jesus Christ. We know God the Father better, His love. <clears throat> Verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart, because he's molding it, may be enlightened, given more light, in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. To live for him in this world no matter what. The riches of his glorious inheritance in all of his holy people. Those who look towards heaven and build treasures in heaven rather than treasures here on earth. Verse 19, and His incomparable great power for us who believe. This power to live as that holy people that He has intended for us to be. That power is the same as the mighty strength He exerted when He raised Christ from the dead and seated Him at the right hand in heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come, that's the end of it, right? And God placed all things under His feet and appointed Him to be head over everything for the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills everything in every way. Now just think if churches were the fullness of Jesus Christ in this world. We'd already be in that millennial reign. We'd already be spending eternity with God in heaven if we really live like Christ in this world. Because the light would have stamped out the darkness by now. Now, I'm not condemning us. It was in the early church just the same. That's why we have most of the letters of the Bible. Because they believed the false doctrine that came in. They wouldn't let go of the things of the world. What's your response to this love story? Will you love and live for the one who loved and gave himself for you? How great is this sovereign God who's in control and rules all things. And He does that so that the world will know Him. Do you know Him? Have you been redeemed? How great is this love that He has given you? How great is this sin debt that has been paid in your life? How great is the power of God that lives inside of you and through you? <laughs> Jesus summed it up. Here's the verdict. Men love darkness rather than light. Do you love the light? Do you profess? Do your good deeds, does your light shine so that your good deeds can be seen? How about in any and every circumstance in your life? Well, that makes it a little more difficult, doesn't it? So that's the time we have to pray even more. To rely on God's power even more. Because Satan will do his best to sway us. He doesn't stop when we become children of light. He attacks us even stronger so that we don't shine like we should. Ephesians chapter 2, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin. Oh, I might not have been that bad, but I still sinned. I was dead. I was not alive at all. I deserve God's wrath in which you used to live when you follow the ways of this world. Oh, as I examine myself even more, <laughs> I can see more, don't I? And you follow the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit, who is now at work in those who are disobedient. 
So if you don't let the Spirit transform you to be obedient and set apart, then you're being disobedient and being guided by the Spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us used to live among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of the flesh and following its desires and thought. And we are definitely in that time and age here in the United States. Everything is about me, myself, and I, and I want it now, right now. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving God's wrath. But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we are dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us with Christ and seated us with Him in heavenly realms. I told you I'd get to that. In Christ Jesus. In order that, okay, why did He seat us there? In the coming ages He might show the incomparable riches of His grace, expressing His kindness to us, because our sin debt has been paid, and now we live for Him. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and it's not of yourself, it's a gift of God. Not of works. Don't think you can boast about these works that, are now, that you now are doing, but instead this is a fulfillment of God and the power of, of God living in you. For we are God's handiwork, what He is molding us, making us into, created in Christ Jesus to do what? To do good works. See, sometimes you miss that. You take the works and say, oh, I'm saved by faith, not by works, so I can't boast. But it also says you are saved by faith to do good works. Don't forget that. Which God prepared in advance before we knew time again. Go back and read the first sentence, how Paul starts in Ephesians. This was his plan from the very beginning that you would glorify Him by the way that you lived and others will see it and hopefully ask you about it. Verse 14, For He Himself is our peace. There you go. Who made the two groups, Gentile and Jew, however you want to say it, and, it, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two. The family of God. Children of the Most High. Priests. Royal priesthood. Children of light. I could go on and on. Thus making peace. Peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. And one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which He put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through Him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Isn't it sad that the Jews who even believe still held on to the law and tried to get the Gentiles to change over to being obedient to the law as well? as it being a requirement for salvation. I mean, Paul's clear here. For through Him he, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of His household. Wow! Again, something that an Israelite would never, ever even comprehend thinking because of how holy God is and the requirements that needed to be to go into God's presence. And now because of Jesus, you can enter the throne room? In fact, you're seated in heavenly realms? Wow! Verse 20, Built on foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Exactly what Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Daniel said. With Christ Jesus Himself as the chief cornerstone. Well, now I can read Ezekiel a little bit better with the eyes of Jesus and see that love story. In Him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in Him you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. That glory of God coming to the temple, <laughs> coming to you and I to be like Jesus in the world. Now, if you don't know, Paul's in prison now. He could say, poor, poor, pitiful me. He could say, wait a minute, I don't deserve this. Or he could say, you know what, i got a mission to do. 
And many of the letters we have are as a result of that. And he sees the reality of Ezekiel's visions of hope lived out in this church in Ephesus. Oh, but be careful. Revelation, Jesus has to write a letter to Ephesus and says what? You've fallen out of the love you first have. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6, this mystery is that through the gospel the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise of Christ Jesus. Verse 9, and to make plain to everyone the administration of this ministry, how this is going to take effect. It's not a mystery anymore to you, it's known to you, which for ages past was kept hidden in God. Oh, now I can read Ezekiel a little differently even still, can I? Who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. I don't know about pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. I don't know about thousand-year literal reign or anything else, but I know what the church is supposed to be living like today. Oh, and tomorrow and each and every day until Christ Jesus returns. So are we doing that? Kim, you want to text Sherry? <laughs> I'm getting close to finishing when we do that, if you don't know, so she can come back. But actually, I don't need her much today since Bonnie's here. His intent was now, now, currently until Jesus Christ returns, and he's going away and we shouldn't fear. We should have peace by the power of the Holy Spirit, the authority and the power, all authority in heaven and on earth given to us to go make disciples and to teach them everything to be obedient to the shepherd. His intent was now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known even to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. God's working out this marvelous plan of salvation through Jesus Christ to mankind to even show His sovereignty to heavenly beings. And we're already sitting there, seated there. Wow, this is way too far from my human brain to comprehend. But I know that it's true because Scripture tells me that it is. And maybe one day I'll realize some of these things. But more than anything, when I get there, I'll fall down... <laughs> And praise God for His wondrous, mighty love, His sovereignty, everything else that He has done for me through Christ Jesus, my Lord. Verse 11, according to His eternal purpose that He has accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Wow. You'll finish Ezekiel, not Ezekiel, you'll finish Ephesians this week. As you do, read it as a love letter. Read it as a spiritual battle. Think about that when you're talking about putting on your armor, and I'll probably talk more about that next week to hopefully give you some more insight there. First thing it says is stand firm. You're in the battle, and if you stand firm, that means you take your ground with that different types of armor because Satan is coming after you, firing those darts that can be quenched. You're in this spiritual battle because... Satan is going to try to make you ineffective as a Christian, as the church. He's going to whisper in your ear, you don't need to do that already, you're saved. Whatever it is, just like he whispered in, in Eve's ear. And every time I think about that, I think about why wasn't Adam saying, come here to Eve. Instead, he was coveting in his own heart, if that's what it was. He wanted to see what would happen. He wanted to see what was there. It was his own sins that were dwelling up inside of him. And it wasn't the devil that made him do it. Maybe we will have a literal thousand year reign where Satan is bound. And we'll see even then that it wasn't because of Satan. It was because sin that fights this war with your soul. But sin has no power over you. It was defeated at the cross. Jesus is specific about it so that you could live for Him. Verse 14, For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family, and if you look at that word and study it, it's not just every, it means the whole family, the entire family, not just as individuals, but collectively as a family. 
from every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. We were created just a little lower than the angels and we're going to be transformed into who knows what. But we saw a little bit of that when Jesus was transformed. I can't wa wait to walk through doors. I don't have to open them anymore. I pray that out of His glorious riches, He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being. The sad thing about a lot of Christians is they're not familiar with the Holy Spirit. Why is that? Because they're not depending on the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit isn't living through them. They know they're sealed, but they don't know the power that Jesus said. If you knew the power again, would you live more like Peter and John and Barnabas and Stephen? I can go on and on. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. All you've got to do is believe. And I pray that you being rooted, tapped into the vine so that you'll produce fruit, and established in love, the love that God has for you so that you can love others, and without knowing God, you can't love others. You may have the power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. How big is that? Well, you can't comprehend it, first of all. But if you could, how big is it? How big is the universe? Can you comprehend that? I, I mean, I can't even begin to, to comprehend that. And God's love is the reason we have the universe and the stars and everything else to declare God's glory so that we can see it and thank Him for it. To grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep the love of Christ is. I think this is a love story. And to know this love that surpasses all knowledge that you may be filled with the, to the measure of the fullness of God. Now in Him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine, according to His power that is at work within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. We know how Jesus was obedient, how He went to the cross and died, how we know that His life glorified the Father in heaven. So we've got to sit back here and say, how is He being glorified in the church? And each and every one of us has a part so you've got to know what gifts the Spirit's given you. You've got to walk in step with the Spirit. And you've got to be obedient to use those gifts. To Him be glory in the church in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. Not just back in the church in Acts, but the church today and the church as it continues until Jesus Christ returns. Forever and ever. And Paul puts it here an amen. Do I get an Amen. Do you agree? Is this what you're called to do? Is this the love story that you now know about so that you can proclaim it to the world? I think back as I was in elementary, maybe even junior high, hey, maybe even high school, and this girl gave me a love note. <laughs> that made my day. From cover to cover. It's God's love for you who sinned against Him, rebelled constantly. And He said, I love you. I love you. I love you. Enough to die for you. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Then follow after me. What does God's love story really mean to you then? What does your pardon mean? What does your redemption mean? How about your adoption? Will you show it through your love story to Him and to others? Father in heaven, we do thank You and praise You that You are an amazing God worthy of all praise, glory, and honor, and power. Lord, forgive us for not comprehending how high and how deep and how vast that Your love is, Lord. It is beyond anything that we could ever, ever comprehend. But we ask you today to prick our hearts, to mold our hearts through the Spirit, this new Spirit that you've given us to change us from the inside out, to make us like Christ in this world, to be obedient, set apart in this world, to be a light in this world to, to others, Lord, to this privilege that you have given us to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ.
Forgive us, Father, when we fail. Help us to have faith that you will continue to grow and grow and grow. Father, pray we pray through the Holy Spirit that we will be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ regardless of the trials and tribulations in our life. Lord, we pray that we don't fall to temptation that Satan puts out there, but we ask you, Lord, that Satan flee from us, that we unite ourselves with one another, that we love one another, that we're there for one another, that we are tied together with Jesus Christ to be like him in this world. I do thank you for this church. Though we are small in number, Lord, we have the power of the Holy Spirit in this church. And Lord, may we live like that, to be lights in this world. We thank you and praise you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.